Excavations in Jordan are evidence that one of the Bible's most dramatic and improbable stories could be literally true, according to top theologian Dr. John Bergsma. He claims archaeological finds in Jordan are proof the biblical city of Sodom really existed, and that a blast that destroyed the city had the power of 1,000 Hiroshima bombs. Scientists previously found evidence that the ancient city of Tel el Hammon in the southern Jordan Valley was destroyed in a catastrophic event, and Bergsma, a professor of theology at Ohio's Franciscan University, suggests such an event mirrors what is in the Bible. According to Genesis, God rained sulfur and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah for their wickedness, completely obliterating them. Examples of such devastation were seen in Tel el Hammon, and what was found completely changed Dr. Bergsma's perspective on the Old Testament. He recalled evidence of extreme heating on skeletons and fragments of pottery found by the archaeologists which could have been proof of a direct hit by an asteroid. About 3,600 years ago, the city of Tel el Hammon was thriving. It was significantly larger and more powerful than Jerusalem or Jericho. But, almost overnight, it was gone. The absence of any arrowheads or other signs of a siege in the ruins suggested that whatever destroyed Tel el Hammon and its neighbor, it wasn't a military attack, according to Bergsma. Stephen Collins, the principal archaeologist at Tel el Hammon, told Dr. Bergsma about some of the astonishing findings. He discovered pieces of pottery on the site that had been covered in trinitite. Trinitite, Dr. Bergsma explained, is that glass layer that you get when you set off an atomic bomb in the desert and it melts the sand. Dr. Bergsma continued, they also started to find human remains, human skeletons that are complete up until about halfway up the backbone, and then there's just a scorch mark, and there's nothing on the top of the body. They found massive evidence that a huge heat blast above the horizon incinerated these twin cities on the Jordanian side of the river. Collins likened the devastation to the Tunska event of 1908 when a massive asteroid slammed into the Earth's atmosphere over Siberia, causing widespread devastation. The airburst also appeared to have produced large amounts of salt, according to James Kennett, Emeritus Professor of Earth Science at the University of California. It calls to mind the story of Lot's wife being turned to salt after the destruction of Sodom. The salt was thrown up due to the high impact pressures, he said, and it may be that the impact partially hit the Dead Sea, which is rich in salt. Kennett said that it's possible the event simply inspired later legends such as Sodom or the destruction of Jericho, but Dr. Bergsma is convinced, saying, It really changed my perspective on the Old Testament map because what it pointed out to me is things that sounded too outlandish to be history is actually shown to be a historical event. Of course, archive viewers understand the biblical account of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is actually a description of an ongoing battle between two factions of the Anunnaki, namely the clans of Enki and Enlil. While Dr. Bergsma's conclusion that these two cities were destroyed by an atomic blast is correct, his supposition that the cause was an asteroid is not accurate. This is not surprising because, as a mainstream academic, he is confined to a shorter and more restricted historical paradigm. In his world, the cause of an atomic explosion at this time period being the result of an actual atomic weapon is beyond possibility. But is it really? A few years back, the Archive produced a documentary titled The Evil Wind in which we discussed this topic. The research of Zachariah Sitchin was presented whereby he explains in depth the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Indeed, Dr. Bergsma's recent findings call for an encore presentation of this video. In ancient Mesopotamian text, we find not only descriptions of weapons of mass destruction, but also their actual use. And of course, what has become known as the Great Calamity was the result of the rivalry between the brothers Inki and Enlil that had began millennia earlier. But during this particular conflict, it was Inki's son Marduk who played the most pivotal role. 
The fateful event is described in a variety of ancient texts from which the what and how, the why and who can be construed, reconstructed, and put into context. Those ancient sources include the Hebrew Bible. For the first Hebrew patriarch, Abraham, was an eyewitness to this awesome calamity. In order to recount this conflict, it is first necessary to go back to when the Anunnaki first came to earth. In fact, we must go back to Nibiru itself, when a young prince named Anu, who claimed direct descendancy from An, challenged King Alelu. Anu won the competition and assumed kingship of Nibiru, causing Alelu to flee to earth. As part of his preparation for his journey, Alelu equipped his celestial chariot with atomic weapons, and it were these weapons that would eventually be used on Earth 4,000 years ago. As we outlined in our first Inky vs. Enlil presentation, the clan rivalries actually extend all the way back to when both Inky and Enlil were back on Nibiru. Enlil had objected to Anu's order to send Inky to Earth, as an emissary in order to verify Alelu's claim of gold discovery and to attempt reconciliation. After arriving on Earth, Inky was subsequently ordered to repair Alelu's ship and make it ready for a gold delivery back to Nibiru. And it was at this point that Inky and his pilot Abgal removed the weapons to a secret cave in the Abzu. Enlil eventually journeyed to Earth in order to verify Inky's discovery of more abundant gold deposits in the Abzu. It took only a couple of shars for Enlil to be exiled for the rape of a young girl named Sud. Abgal piloted Enlil to his place of exile, but then in a twist Abgal explained the location was actually where he and Inky had hidden the weapons of Terra. Enlil's knowledge of the weapon's location would have dire consequences, as we will see. The chain of events that led to the use of the weapons of Terra are convoluted and span as far back as the antediluvial period. Many conflicts occurred between the two rival clans in the millennia preceding the Great Calamity. To make a long story short, the decision to use these weapons of Terra was predicated on the ascendancy claims against Inky's firstborn son, Marduk. A significant number of Anunnaki were opposed to Marduk and or his son, Nabu. Ninurta, Nanner, Ishkur, Yutu, Inanna, and even his two brothers, Nergal and Ningizida, all had their own personal motivations to move against Marduk and his son. Running up to the end of the third millennium BCE, the Enlilites had unsuccessfully attempted to subdue the rebel lands of Marduk, who was also known as Ra and Amun-Ra during that time. On Enlil's instructions, Ninurta got busy setting up an alternative space facility on the other side of the world in Peru, South America. The texts indicate that Enlil himself was away from Sumer for long stretches of time. These gods' moves caused the last two kings of Sumer, Shusin and Ibisin, to waver in their allegiances and to start paying homage to Inki in his Sumerian foothold, Iridu. The divine absences also loosened control over the Elamites, and the records speak of sacrileges by the Elamite troops. Especially enraged was Marduk, who received word of looting, destructions, and desecrations in his cherished Babylon. It will be recalled that the last time he was there, he was persuaded by his half-brother Nergal to leave peacefully until the celestial time would reach the age of the ram. He did so having received Nergal's solemn word that nothing would be disturbed or desecrated in Babylon, but the opposite happened. Marduk was angered by the reported desecration of his temple there by the Elamites. Quote, to herds of dogs, Babylon's temple they made a den, flying ravens, loudly shrieking, their dung dropped there. End quote. From Haran he cried out to the great gods, Until when? Has not the time arrived yet, he asked in his prophetic autobiography? O oh, great gods, learn my secrets, as I girdle my belt, my memories remember. I am the divine Marduk, a great god. 
I was cast off from my sins, to the mountains I have gone. In many lands I have been a wanderer. From where the sun rises to where it sets I went. To the highland of Hatti I came. In Hatti land I ask for an oracle. In it I ask, until when? Twenty-four years in Haran's midst I nested, Marduk went on. My days are completed. The time has come, he said, to set his course to his city Babylon, my temple to rebuild, my everlasting abode to establish. He spoke of seeing his temple, Isagila, meaning temple whose head is lofty, rising as a mountain upon a platform in Babylon, calling it the house of my covenant. He foresaw Babylon as forever established, a king of his choice installed there, a city filled with joy, a city blessed by Anu. The messianic times, Marduk prophesied, will chase away evil and bad luck, bring motherly love to mankind. The year in which a sojourn of twenty-four years in Haran was completed was 2024 BCE. It marked seventy-two years since Marduk had agreed to depart from Babylon and await the oracular celestial time. Marduk's until when appeal to the great gods was not an idle one, for the leadership of the Anunnaki was constantly consulting informally and informal councils. Alarmed by the worsening situation, Enlil hurriedly returned to Sumer and was shocked to learn that things had gone wrong even in Nippur itself. Ninurta was summoned to explain the Elamites' misconduct, but Ninurta put all the blame on Marduk and Nabu. Nabu was summoned, and before the gods the son of his father came. His main accuser was Utu, also known as Shamash, who, describing the dire situation, said, All this Nabu has caused to happen. Speaking for his father, Nabu blamed Ninurta and revived the old accusations against Nergal in regard to the disappearance of the pre-diluvial monitoring instruments and the failure to prevent sacrileges in Babylon. He got into a shouting match with Nergal, and, showing disrespect to Enlil evil, he spoke. There is no justice. Destruction was conceived. Enlil against Babylon caused evil to be planned. It was an unheard-of accusation against the Lord of the Command. Enki spoke up, but it was in defense of his son, not of Enlil. What are Marduk and Nabu actually accused of, he asked. His ire was directed especially at his son Nergal. Why do you continue the opposition, he asked him. The two argued so much that in the end Enki shouted to Nergal to get out of his presence. The gods' council broke up in disarray. But all these debates, accusations, and counter-accusations were taking place against the increasingly realized fact. What Marduk referred to as the celestial oracle, with the passage of time, with the crucial shift of the processional clock by one degree, the age of the bull, the zodiacal age of Enlil, was coming to an end, and the age of the ram, Marduk's age, was looming in the heavens. Ninurta could see it coming at his Inanu temple in Lagash, Ningazita slash Thoth could confirm it from all the stone circles that he had erected elsewhere on earth, and the people knew it too. It was then that Nergal, vilified by Marduk and Nabu, ordered out by his father Enki, consulting with himself, concocted the idea of resort to the awesome weapons. He did not know where they were hidden, but knew they existed on earth, locked away in a secret underground place. Those seven, in the mountains they abide, in a cavity inside the earth they dwell. Based on our current level of technology, they can be described as seven nuclear devices. Clad with terror, with a brilliance they rush forth. A war council of the gods, overruling Enki, voted to follow Nergal's suggestion to give Marduk a punishing blow. There was constant communication with Anu. Anu to earth, the words was speaking. Earth to Anu, the words pronounced. He made it clear 
that his approval for the unprecedented step was limited to depriving Marduk of the Sinai spaceport, but that neither gods nor people should be harmed. Anu, Lord of the Gods, on the earth had pity, the ancient records state. Choosing Nergal and Ninurta to carry out the mission, the gods made absolutely clear to them its limited and conditional scope. But that is not what happened. The law of unintended consequences proved itself true on a catastrophic level. In the aftermath of the calamity that resulted in the death of countless people and the desolation of Sumer, Nergal dictated to a trusted scribe his own version of the events, trying to exonerate himself. The long text is known as the Era Epos, for it refers to Nergal by the epithet Era, the Annihilator, and Ninurta as Ishum, the Scorcher. We can put together the true story by adding to this text information from several other Sumerian, Akkadian, and Biblical sources. Thus, we find that no sooner was the decision reached than Nergal rushed to Gibbal's African domain to find and retrieve the weapons, not waiting for Ninurta. To his dismay, Ninurta learnt that Nergal was disregarding the objective's limits and was going to use the weapons indiscriminately to settle personal accounts. Quote, I shall annihilate the son and let the father bury him. Then I shall kill the father and let no one bury him, Nergal had boasted. While the two argued, word reached them that Nabu was not sitting still. From his temple to marshal all his cities he set his step. Toward the great sea he set his course. The great sea he entered, set upon the throne that was not his. Nabu was not only converting the western cities, he was taking over the Mediterranean islands and setting himself up as their ruler. Nergal, slash Ira, thus argued that destroying the spaceport was not enough. Nabu and the cities that rallied to him also had to be punished and destroyed. Now, with two targets, the nergal Ninurta team saw another problem. Would the upheavaling of the spaceport not sound the alarm for Nabu and his sending followers to escape? Reviewing their targets, they found the solution in splitting up. Ninurta would attack the spaceport. Nergal would attack the nearby sinning cities. But, as all this was agreed upon, Ninurta had second thoughts. He insisted that not only the Anunnaki who manned the space facility should be forewarned, but that even certain people should be forewarned. Valiant Ira, he told Nergal, Will you, the righteous, destroy with the unrighteous? Will you destroy those who against you have not sinned with those who against you have sinned? Nergal slash Ira, the ancient text states, was persuaded. The words of Isham appealed to Ira as fine oil. And so, one morning, the two, sharing the seven nuclear explosives between them, set out on their ultimate mission. Then did the hero Ira go ahead, remembering the words of Isham. Isham too went forth, in accordance with the words given, a squeezing in his heart. The available texts even tell us who went to what target. Isham, to the Mount Most Supreme, set his course. We know that the spaceport was beside this mount from the Epic of Gilgamesh. Isham raised his hand, the mount was smashed. That which was raised toward Anu to launch was caused to wither. Its face was made to fade away. Its place was made desolate. In one nuclear blow, the spaceport and its facilities were obliterated by the hand of Ninurta. The ancient text then describes what Nergal did. Emulating Isham, Ira, the way of the king followed, the cities he finished off, to desolation he overturned them. His targets were the sinning cities whose kings had formed the alliance against the kings of the east, the plain in the south of the Dead Sea. And so it was that in the year 2024 BCE, nuclear weapons were unleashed in the Sinai Peninsula and in the nearby plain of the Dead Sea, 
and the spaceport and the five cities were no more. It is no wonder that Abraham and his mission in Canaan is understood the way we explain it. It is in this apocalyptic event that the biblical record and the Mesopotamian text converge. We know from the Mesopotamian text relating the events that, as required, the Anunnaki guarding the spaceport were forewarned. The two, Nergal and Ninurta, incited to commit the evil, made its guardians stand aside, the gods of that place abandoned it, its protectors went up to the heights of heaven. But while the Mesopotamian texts reiterate that the two made the gods flee, made them flee the scorching, they are ambiguous regarding whether that advance notice was also extended to the people in the doomed cities. It is here that the Bible provides missing details. We read in Genesis that both Abraham and his nephew Lot were indeed forewarned, but not the other residents of the sinning cities. The biblical report, apart from throwing light on the upheavaling aspects of the events, contains details that shed an amazing light on the gods in general and on their relationship with Abraham in particular. The story begins in chapter 18 of Genesis when Abraham, now 99 years old, sitting at the entrance to his tent on a hot midday, lifted his eyes and all of a sudden saw three men standing above him. Though they are described as Anishim, men, there was something different and unusual about them, for he rushed out of his tent and bowed to the ground and, referring to himself as their servant, washed their feet and offered them food. As it turned out, the three were divine beings. As they leave, their leader, now identified as the Lord God, decides to reveal to Abraham the trio's mission, to determine whether Sodom and Gomorrah are indeed sinning cities whose upheavaling is justified. While two of the three continue toward Sodom, Abraham approaches and reproaches God with words that are identical to those in the Mesopotamian text. Wilt thou destroy the righteous with the unrighteous? What followed was an incredible bargaining session between man and God. Perchance there are fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou destroy and not spare the city on account of the fifty righteous within it? Abraham asked God. When told that, well, the city would be spared if fifty righteous men reside there, Abraham said, What about just forty? What about only thirty? And so it went down to ten, and Yahweh went away as soon as he had finished speaking, and Abraham returned to his place. The other two divine beings, known as Malachim, meaning literally emissaries but commonly translated angels, arrived in Sodom in the evening. The happenings there confirmed its people's wickedness, and at daybreak the two urged Abraham's nephew Lot to escape with his family for Yahweh is about to destroy the city. The lingering family asked for more time, and one of the angels agreed to have the upheaval delayed long enough for Lot and his family to reach the safer mountain. And Abraham got up early in the morning, and he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the plain, and beheld, and lo, vapor went up from the earth as the smoke of a furnace. Abraham was then 99 years old, having been born in 2123 BCE. The time had to be 2024 BCE. The convergence of the Mesopotamian text with the biblical narrative of Genesis concerning the upheaval of Sodom and Gomorrah is at once one of the most significant confirmations of the Bible's veracity in general and of Abraham's status and role in particular, and yet one of the most shunned by theologians and other scholars because of its reports of the events of the preceding day, the day three divine beings, angels who looked like men, had paid Abraham a visit. It smacks too much of an ancient astronaut's tale.
Those who question the Bible or treat the Mesopotamian text as just myths have sought to explain the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah as some natural calamity, yet the biblical version confirms twice that the upheaval by fire and sulfur was not a natural calamity, but a premeditated, postponable, and even cancelable event. Once when Abraham bargained with the Lord to spare the cities so as not to destroy the righteous with the unjust, and again when his nephew Lot obtained a postponement of the upheaval. The two, as it turned out, did more than destroy the spaceport and the sinning cities. As a result of the nuclear explosions, a storm, the evil wind, went around in the skies. And the chain reaction of unintended consequences began. The historical records show that the Sumerian civilization collapsed in the sixth year of the reign in Ur of Ibisin. In 2024 BCE, it was, the viewer will recall, the very year in which Abraham was 99 years old. Scholars assumed at first that Sumer's capital, Ur, was overrun by barbarian invaders, but no evidence for such a destructive invasion was found. A text titled, A Lamentation Over the Destruction of Ur, was then discovered. It puzzled the scholars, for it bewailed not the physical destruction of Ur, but its abandonment. The gods who had dwelt there abandoned it. The people who dwelt there were gone. Its stables were empty. The temples, the houses, the sheepfolds remained intact, standing but empty. Other lamentation texts were then discovered. They lamented not just Ur, but all of Sumer. Again, they spoke of abandonment. Not only did the gods of Ur, Nanner, and Nagal abandon Ur, Enlil, the wild bull, abandoned his beloved temple in Nippur. His spouse, Ninlil, was also gone. Nimma abandoned her city in Kesh, and Nana, the queen of Erech, abandoned Erech. Ninurta forsook his temple, Ininu, his spouse Baal was also gone from Lagash. One Sumerian city after another was listed as having been abandoned, without their gods, people, or animals. The scholars were now puzzling over some dire catastrophe, a mysterious calamity that affected the whole of Sumer. What could it be? The answer to the puzzle was right there in those texts. Gone with the wind. That was the refrain in the Lamentation text. Enlil has abandoned his temple. He was gone by the wind. Ninlil from her temple was gone by the wind. Nanner has abandoned Ur. His sheepfolds were gone by the wind. And so on and on. The scholars have assumed that this repetition of words was a literary device, a refrain that the lamenters repeated over and over again to highlight their grief. But that was no literary device. That was the literal truth. Sumer and its cities were literally emptied as a result of a wind. An evil wind, the lamentation and then other text reported came blowing and caused a calamity, one unknown to men, to befall the land. It was an evil wind that caused cities to be desolate, caused houses to be desolate, caused stalls to be desolate, the sheepfolds to be emptied. There was desolation, but no destruction, emptiness, but no ruins. The cities were there, the houses were there, the stalls and sheepfolds were there, but nothing alive remained. Even Sumer's rivers flow with water that is bitter. The once cultivated fields grow weeds. In the meadows, the plants have withered. All life is gone. It was a calamity that had never happened before. On the land, Sumer a calamity fell, one unknown to men, 
one that had never been seen before, one which could not be withstood. Carried by the evil wind, it was a death from which there was no escape. It was a death which roams the street, is let loose in the road, the highest wall, the thickest wall, it passes like a flood. No door can shut it out, no bolt can turn it back. Those who hid behind doors were felled inside, those who ran to the rooftops died on the roofs. It was an unseen death. It stands beside a man, yet no one can see it. When it enters a house, its appearance is unknown. It was a gruesome death. Cough and phlegm weakened the chest. The mouth was filled with spittle. Dumbness and daze have come upon them. An overwhelming dumbness, a headache. As the evil wind clutched its victims, their mouths were drenched with blood. The dead and dying were everywhere. The texts make it clear that the evil wind, bearing gloom from city to city, was not a natural calamity. It resulted from a deliberate decision of the great gods. It was caused by a great storm ordered by Anu, a decision from the heart of Enlil, and it was the result of a single event, spawned in a single spawning in a lightning flash. An event that occurred far away in the west. From the midst of the mountains it had come, from the plain of no pity it had come, like a bitter venom of the gods, from the west it had come. That the cause of the evil wind was the nuclear upheaval back in and near the Sinai Peninsula was made clear when the text asserted that the gods knew its source and cause, a blast, an explosion. An evil blast heralded the baleful storm. An evil blast was its forerunner. Mighty offspring, valiant sons, were the heralds of the pestilence. The authors of the Lamentation text, the gods themselves, left us a vivid record of what had taken place. As soon as the awesome weapons were launched from the skies by Ninurta and Nergal, they spread awesome rays, scorching everything like fire. The resulting storm in a flash of lightning was created, a dense cloud that brings doom, a nuclear mushroom, then rose to the sky, followed by rushing gust of wind, a tempest that scorches the heavens. It was a day not to be forgotten. On that day, when heaven was crushed and the earth was smitten, its face obliterated by the maelstorm, when the skies were darkened and covered as with a shadow, on that day the evil wind was born. The various texts kept attributing the venomous maelstorm to the explosion at the place where the gods ascend and descend, to the obliteration of the spaceport, rather than to the destruction of the sinning cities. It was there, in the midst of the mountains, that the nuclear mushroom cloud arose in a brilliant flash, and it was from there that the prevailing winds, coming from the Mediterranean Sea, carried the poisonous nuclear cloud eastward towards Sumer, and there it caused not destruction, but a silent annihilation, bringing death by nuclear-poisoned air to all that lives. It is evident from all the relevant texts that, with the possible exception of Inky, who had protested and warned against the use of the awesome weapons, none of the gods involved expected the eventful outcome. Most of them were earthborn, and to them the tales of nuclear wars on Nibiru were tales of the elders. Did Anu, who should have known better, think perhaps that the weapons hidden so long ago would hardly work or not work at all? Did Enlil and Ninurta, who had come from Nibiru, assume that the winds, if at all, would blow the nuclear cloud toward the desolate deserts that are now Arabia? There is no satisfactory answer. The text only state that the great gods paled at the storm's immensity. But it is clear that as soon as the direction of the winds and the intensity of the nuclear venom were realized, an alarm was sounded for those in the wind's path, gods and people alike, to run for their lives. 
The panic, fear, and confusion that overtook Sumer and its cities as the alarm was sounded are vividly described in a series of lamentation texts such as the Ur Lamentation, the Lamentation over the Desolation of Ur and Sumer, the Nippur Lamentation, the Uruk Lamentation, and others. As far as the gods were concerned, it appears that it was by and large each man for himself, using their varied craft they took off by air and by water to get out of the wind's path. As for the people, the gods did sound the alarm before they fled, as described in the Uruk Lamentation, rise up, run away, hide in the steppe. The people were told in the middle of the night. Seized with terror, the loyal citizens of Uruk ran for their lives, but they were felled by the evil wind anyway. Iridu, Inki City, lying farthest to the south, was apparently at the edge of the evil wind's path. We learn from the Iridu lament that Ninki, Inki's spouse, flew away from the city to a safe haven in Inki's African Abzu. Ninki, the great lady, flying like a bird, left her city. But Inki himself departed from the city only far enough to get out of the evil wind's way. The lord of Iridu stayed outside his city. For the fate of his city, he wept with bitter tears. Many of Iridu's citizens followed him, camping in the fields at a safe distance as they watched. For a day and a half, the storm put its hands on Iridu. As the evil wind passed and blew away, its remnants, we learn, reached the Zargus Mountains farther east. It left Sumer desolate and prostrate. The storm desolated the cities, desolated the houses. The dead, lying where they fell, remained unburied. The dead people, like fat placed in the sun of themselves, melted away. In the grazing lands, cattle large and small became scarce. All living creatures came to an end. The sheepfolds were delivered to the wind. The cultivated fields withered. On the banks of the Tigris and the Euphrates, only sickly weeds grew. In the swamps, the reeds rotted in a stench. No one treads the highways. No one seeks out the roads. O Temple of Nanner in Ur, bitter is thy desolation, the lamentation poems be willed. O Ningal, whose land has perished, make thy heart like water. The city has become a strange city. How can one now exist? The house has become a house of tears. It makes my heart like water. Ur and its temples have been delivered to the wind. After 2,000 years, the great Sumerian civilization was gone with the wind.